Deciding that you want to settle down and take dating seriously can be an exciting time in anyone's life. The prospect of meeting that one person who you want to spend your life with and build a family with. But with that comes certain dangers. You are opening yourself up to meeting new people, not knowing anything about them or their pasts. Letting people into your life and the lives of your loved ones with the hopes that your new partner will be a good fit. But the devastating truth is that sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes we meet people who have very dark, disturbing pasts, pasts that lead to absolute chaos and devastation. But before we get into this case, I want to say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Dave. Finances can be so intimidating no matter your education, background, or how smart you might be. We all need a little financial help sometimes, and that is why I love Dave. Dave is the banking app that is leveling the playing field and making managing your finances so much easier. Dave gives their members something that traditional banks won't. Interest-free cash advances up to $500 in five minutes or less with no credit check and no late fees. It all started with overdrafts. Being that Americans pay banks billions in overdraft fees each year, Dave wanted to make those predatory fees a thing of the past. With Dave, if you've overdrafted your account, they will spot you the money you need without charging charging the standard $35 because guess what? Overdrafts happen. I had recently overdrafted my account because of all of my bills, including my student loan payments, were taken out of my account before I got paid and I totally did not realize that that was going to happen. But thanks to Dave, I avoided an overdraft fee while I waited for my paycheck to clear. Since Dave introduced advances back in 2017, their users have avoided losing $2.5 billion in overdrafts thanks to advances. The bank's responses? Banks are starting to cut back on those predatory charges to make up for it. Dave's extra cash account gives you the money you need to fill the gas tank, buy groceries, and spot the extra cash that you need to make rent without having to wait for your next paycheck. No interest, no hidden fees. So download Dave today at dave.com slash Rachel Shannon and you can get up to $500 in five minutes. No credit check, no late fees. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Eligibility criteria and instant transfer fees apply and banking services are provided by Evolve, member FDIC. Again, head to dave.com slash Rachel Shannon and you can get up to $500 in five minutes or less when you download Dave. Thank you again so much to Dave for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the devastating case of Danielle Finlay Jones. Danielle Finlay Jones was 31 years old at the time of her death and was living in Kogara, New South Wales, Australia. At the time, Danielle was working as a teacher at Trinity Preschool Montessori and as a student learning support officer for the New South Wales Department of Education. She also played football at the Ramsgate Rams RSL Football Club, where she had played for 25 years. She went on to become the captain of the team, and because she had been there for so long, she was very well-loved and respected by the organization and her teammates alike. A spokesperson for Danielle's team would go on to say, quote, Danielle was a beautiful person, a life member of the club who is much loved and very well respected not only within our immediate football community, but also throughout the Football St. George Association. Hi, Danielle here, Senior Vice President for Female Football, and it's Female Football Week. So I wanted to take this moment to reflect on what the club has achieved. Some 25 years ago, when I started out at Ramsgate RSL Football Club as a female footballer, we didn't have female-only teams. So I was playing with the boys up until I was 12 years old. Fast forward to today, and we have fielded female-only teams from under six all the way through to all-age women. What an achievement. We continue to make strides within the community and push forward to promote female footballers. So well done, everyone, and I hope you've all had a lovely week. Go the girls. One family friend of Danielle said that when she was young, her parents split up and that did have an impact on her as it would for any child. But despite her struggles in life, she was known to be a kind, selfless soul who would go out of her way to help anybody in need. She was a bright young woman, social and chatty, who made friends easily. She brought light into every room she walked into. She was just a ball of energy who loved dancing and was the life of the party. Danielle was also known to be very close with her mother, Jackie, and her brother, Blake. 
Danielle was living at home with her mother throughout her entire life and at the time of her death. Those who knew the family said that Danielle and Jackie spent as much time together as possible. She and her mom could be seen at the local pub together or just hanging out. Danielle spent her weekdays teaching her students and on the weekends, she was playing sports and hanging out with friends. She was a very active and social young woman with so much life to live ahead of her. But of course, while Danielle was very active in her social life and was happy with her career, she was also looking for love. She wanted a relationship, so she took to the dating apps to find her future partner. She was at the point in her life where she wanted to settle down. She wanted to have kids and a family, so she was looking for something serious. It's been reported a little bit differently depending on what source you look at. Some say she was on Tinder, some say Bumble, though I have seen Bumble reported more frequently. Either way, it was on a dating app where 31-year-old Danielle met 33-year-old Ashley Gaddy, who worked as a tradesman. By early December of 2022, the two went on two dates and it seemed like they had connected really quickly. Even though they had only gone on a few dates, the two started a relationship and Jackie actually met Ashley. This was a big deal because this was the first boyfriend that Danielle had ever brought around her friends and family. According to Jackie, the two seemed to just click. They seemed to get along great, and it appeared that they wanted the same things in their relationships and in life. Ashley wanted a serious relationship. He wanted a family and kids. He wanted to settle down just like Danielle. According to a friend of Danielle's, Danielle was drawn to Ashley because he was unlike anyone she had ever dated before. He had a bit more of a dominant personality. He challenged her, which she really enjoyed. By December 17th, 2022, Danielle and Ashley had their third date. Danielle had brought Ashley along to her annual Christmas get-together with her friends. This again was the first time, this was the first time that Danielle's group of friends had met Ashley, and again, it was the first time that she brought any of her dates to meet her friends. So, this was a very big moment for Danielle. The night started out pleasant and fun. The group of friends were together at a pub in Marsden Park, eating bar food and playing drinking games. According to the friends, Danielle and Ashley seemed to really vibe with one another. Danielle and Ashley were all cuddled up together and enjoying each other's company. She really seemed happy with him, which was so nice for her friends to see. They were so excited to see her enjoying this new relationship. She wasn't someone who normally dated, so seeing her like this was really cool for her friends. I feel like a lot of us have that one friend who is chronically single, doesn't really date, but then they do find a partner and you see how happy they make each other and it just warms your heart. But as the night went on, Danielle and Ashley actually got into an argument over a drinking game. I guess in the game, there was a question of whether Danielle had ever had a one night stand and she answered yes. My guess was that it's like a never have I ever type of game. But after Ashley heard Danielle's answer, he became enraged. He told Danielle that he didn't know she had ever had a one-night stand and that she previously told him that she never had done that. He then got up from the table and stormed away before going on his phone and starting to message Danielle over and over and over about it, calling her a liar and things like that. Obviously, this was a little bit concerning for friends to see, but after that, Danielle got up and spoke with Ashley away from the group for about 20 minutes. After speaking, it seems like they had calmed down and were getting along again. They joined the rest of the group and friends said that they went back to being close and cuddly. After joining the friends again, they all had a few more drinks before leaving the pub and heading to Danielle's best friend's Taylor's house to stay the night. By around 1, 1.30 a.m., Taylor and her partner went into their room to go to bed while Danielle and Ashley slept in the spare bedroom. In the middle of the night after they had been asleep, Taylor's partner woke her up saying, did you hear that? Taylor listened for a few minutes, but it sounded like there were sexual noises happening in the other room, so they laughed it off and went back to sleep, thinking that her friend was just having a good time in the next room over. But... By the next morning, when Taylor and her partner woke up, they didn't hear anything from Danielle. The morning turned into early afternoon, and Taylor started to notice that Danielle had been sleeping for a really long time. 
By around 1.30 or 2 p.m., she went into the spare bedroom to check on Danielle, expecting to see her just lying around, probably hungover and cranky from the night before, but this isn't what she found. Upon walking into the room, she found the bed empty, so she went around to the other side of the bed, and there she found Danielle lying on the floor covered by a blanket with blood all over her face and bruising to her face and neck. Taylor called Danielle's name several times, but she wasn't moving or responding. Of course, when she found her best friend in that condition, Taylor didn't know what to think. She was probably in denial at first, thinking that there's no way that Danielle could really be gone, but once it clicked in her head, she realized that something horrible happened to Danielle. Of course, after finding Danielle's body, Taylor and her partner called Triple Zero to report what happened. When police responded, they found Danielle, who was in brutal condition. Danielle's face and neck were covered in heavy bruising, and she had a bloody nose. Unfortunately, at that time, 31-year-old Danielle Finlay-Jones was pronounced dead at the scene. After this horrific discovery, her body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner determined that she had died as a result of blunt force trauma, manual strangulation, and suffocation. The ME would later say that her injuries indicate that her attacker straddled her and then covered her mouth, preventing her from breathing, as he beat her to death by hitting her in the face repeatedly. Of course, her manner of death was determined to be homicide. Right away, after discovering Danielle's body in such brutal condition, police issued an arrest warrant and started searching for 33-year-old Ashley Gaddy. At that point, there was no one else who could have possibly done this. He was the last person with her in that room before Danielle was found dead. Police found no sign of a break-in, no sign of a robbery, or anything else that indicated anyone else could have been responsible. Investigators also found Ashley's fingerprints on the screen of the window in that spare bedroom, indicating that he had fled the home through the window. During that two-day search, police actually intercepted a phone call between Ashley and his mother. In the call, Ashley told his mother that him and Danielle slept in separate beds. He said that Danielle wanted to have sex, but he said no. He continued saying, quote, I didn't do it. I effing panicked. I woke up at 9.30 and there's an effing body in the next room. It was through this phone call to his mother that police were actually able to track Ashley down to a rugged, isolated area in the Blue Mountains in New South Wales. There, officers found Ashley on the other side of a safety barrier atop a cliff at Fletcher's Lookout. He began scaling down the other side, perching himself just far enough down that officers couldn't reach him. Obviously, this created a very delicate, high-stakes situation for everyone involved. For Ashley, one wrong step and he could lose his life. For investigators, if he fell, they would have no way to bring him in and make him face justice for what he did. So, they called in their negotiation specialist unit to come in and try to de-escalate the scene. These negotiators spoke with Ashley for the 12 hours that followed. Finally, by around midnight that same day, after this tense standoff, an officer was able to reach Ashley and helped him up to the ledge to safety. Immediately, they arrested him on charges of murder. High in the Blue Mountains, precariously balanced, accused killer Ashley Gaddy on the wrong side of the safety fence. Police negotiators have moved in and will spend the next 12 hours trying to talk him back. His life and their case literally hanging in the balance. He may have gone there out of panic, but the first thing would be to make sure he was comfortable and build some rapport. Dr Vincent Hurley, a former negotiator turned criminologist, says the stakes for police were high. Police have to be aware that they don't get too close to the individual so they might grab them and pull them over the edge. The negotiations went on, they gave him water and eventually a safety harness, convincing him to stay tethered until the 33-year-old, who'd previously posted pictures of himself near the same lookout, was talked down at midnight. Very good work from the negotiators. This morning he was driven from Katoomba to Penrith to face court for the murder of his 31-year-old Tinder date, Danielle Finlay-Jones, at Cranebrook on Sunday. 
Police say they have no doubts they would have been dealing with two deaths in this case if it hadn't been for the calm and patient work of the negotiators overnight, saying if Gaddy had fallen over this cliff, he wouldn't have survived. It's a 100 metre drop. So whilst most people might say, you know, why bother? At the end of the day, it's for justice for the victim. Of course, after Danielle's family found out about the murder of their beloved daughter and sister, they were just devastated. They couldn't wrap their heads around how someone could do something so horrific to someone as kind and loving as Danielle. The way Ashley attacked Danielle and overpowered her while beating her to death, that was just an inconceivable level of violence. Knowing that was bad enough. But once Ashley was arrested, they were hit with yet another devastating blow. They found out that Danielle isn't actually the first victim of Ashley's not even close. Ashley Gaddy had a long history of committing domestic violence against women. Between the years of 2016 through 2021, five different women had taken out apprehended violence orders out against Ashley. By 2021, Ashley was convicted of assault after choking and stalking an ex-girlfriend. But with this case, the judge decided that Ashley posed a low risk of reoffending, so Ashley was only sentenced to community service. That following year, in 2022, he was charged with another assault to which he spent some time in jail, but he was released on bail just months before he met Danielle. Now, one woman who had previously dated Ashley came forward to the media after seeing his name pop up in the news from his arrest for Danielle's murder. This woman's name has been released publicly, but for the sake of the video, I will not be mentioning her name here for the sake of privacy. Either way, this woman said that one day, she randomly received a Facebook friend request from Ashley. After meeting, the pair dated for three months. According to her, Ashley was controlling, abusive, and a violent narcissist. She said that when she first started dating him, he would be normal and pleasant, making you think he was a good man. But once she got comfortable, he would switch like a light and became mentally abusive and controlling, making her feel absolutely worthless. That then progressed to him becoming physically violent. Of course, after an episode of him lashing out and hurting her, he would go back to being the kind, loving boyfriend who profusely apologized for his actions. But of course, the cycle never stopped. It kept going until she got just so sick and tired of being treated that way, so she finally ended the relationship. But once she did, he tried to murder her. Back in July of 2021, this woman was living with her father in his home near Sydney, Australia. One night, Ashley burst into the home in a rage and began attacking the woman, smashing her head into the ground and trying to strangle her. In the midst of this whole thing, she lost her phone so she wasn't able to call for help, and although her father was home, he was on the other side of the house and didn't hear anything at first. While fighting, Ashley smashed the window and punched a hole in the wall as he threatened to kill this woman. She was eventually able to get free, so she hid behind a door and locked herself in. Eventually, the woman's father realized what was going on and finally was able to call the police, who came quickly and apprehended Ashley. The woman would go on to say that if it wasn't for her barricading herself behind a door and her dad hearing the commotion, he wouldn't have stopped until he killed her. After his arrest and subsequent court hearing, the woman told the courts that Ashley is a violent man and will kill someone. He is going to continue these violent outbursts until someone is seriously hurt or killed. But even after warning the courts of just how violent of an offender Ashley was, he was still released on bail, allowing him to be out and dating again. And as we know, this allowed him to meet Danielle and murder her. As more photos emerged of him online, confirmation of 14 previous domestic violence charges and that he was halfway through a two-year community service sentence for offences against another woman. We will look at that case and whatever we can do, particularly in that space, uh, we should. This woman's daughter was formerly engaged to Gaddy. They were due to marry in Bali. I never liked the guy. Angela relieved when they broke up after six years. Possessive, jealous, had her in tears at nearly every family event. 
At first, after Danielle's murder, her family put forth all of their efforts to work with prosecutors to get Ashley's case tried and get him behind bars for what he did to her. Make him face her family, the people who loved her most. However, her family would be robbed of this opportunity and yet another horrific turn of events. 16 months after Ashley's arrest on April 6, 2024, Ashley Gaddy was found dead in his prison cell by prison staff. As of the most recent article I've been able to find on this case, we don't yet know the cause of death. Obviously, it's assumed to be suicide, but we don't know any further details at this time. Reports say that the New South Wales Police are conducting an investigation into what happened. What we do know is that Ashley will no longer have to face the consequences of what he did. Danielle's family will never get to face him and ask him why he did what he did or let him know just how much of a disgusting, vile monster he truly is. Obviously, this was just heartbreaking for the family. They wanted to see him face justice for his actions. But now that this wasn't going to happen, they put their efforts into working with authorities to hopefully make some positive change in Australia to prevent this from happening to anybody else. After finding out all of that information about Ashley, obviously her family and the community as a whole were absolutely enraged. First of all, the courts failed Danielle by allowing a violent repeat offender to be out on the streets. Second of all, even though Ashley did have this criminal history and several AVOs out against him, he was still able to get on the dating apps and meet unsuspecting women who had no idea of his history. This should not be allowed. The family truly believes that if these dating apps required background checks and didn't allow these violent men on the apps, that Danielle and so many other women would be alive today. So Danielle's family, as well as other families of women who have also died due to domestic violence, are pleading with their government for bail reform legislation. They are proposing that police be notified if perpetrators breach bail or court orders via an electronic monitoring device something that tracks each and every offender to make sure that the courts are aware of what these people are doing and when. Danielle's family are also working to try and get police checks introduced on dating apps. They know that it'll take a lot of time and effort to enact these changes, but they said that if they can even save one woman from facing the same fate as Danielle, it'll be worth it. As of right now, because this is such a recent case, I haven't heard if anything has actually been changed yet because as we know, the wheels of justice and making changes turn very slowly, but I genuinely hope that the family of Danielle and every other family working for change are rewarded. I absolutely agree that Ashley never should have been allowed on bail after showing that he's going to continue these behaviors and that he isn't going to stop. So often, we hear of criminal justice systems focusing on reforming a perpetrator, making sure that they are treated as fairly as possible by the system. But what about the victims? What about the poor women who were hurt by these violent offenders who have to live in fear while their attacker is out on bail? The justice system needs to start placing so much more of an emphasis on the victim and stop worrying so much about fairness for violent criminals. And then when it comes to dating apps, I 100% agree that they need to be doing background checks for every single person who signs up. Apps should not be allowing people with violent criminal histories to be dating on their platform, and I truly believe if this is enacted, that so many lives will be saved from future violence. But while we can certainly hope for changes like this, we know that it's not always going to happen. Sometimes the world doesn't work that way, and it's not built for safety and for everybody to have equal opportunities. So as a piece of advice to you all, don't rely on dating apps to protect you. Rely on yourself. If you're going on a first date, make sure it's in a public setting. Don't let your date convince you to come over to their place or let them come over to your place. Don't go with them alone on a hike or anything like that. That is something that Danielle actually did right. But after those initial dates, anytime you are considering dating someone more long-term, as crazy as it sounds, 
run a background check on them. At least within the United States, depending on the county your date lives in, sometimes you can go to that county's website, search up their name, and their criminal records will pop right up for free. If you try that and it doesn't work, like the county doesn't allow you to actually go on and get the records without like going and filing requests and things like that, then look up how to run a background check on someone. There are tons of websites that will do this for a fee, but it usually isn't that expensive for a basic background check. I've done it for like $10 before, and even if it does cost you more than that, Trust me, your safety and peace of mind is 100% worth it. Obviously, I'm not saying to run a background check on every single person you meet. You don't have to do it for every first date you're going to be going on. But if you are considering going long term with someone, there really is no hurt in running a background check and just making sure that things are okay. Because obviously, not every date is going to work out. Not every partner is going to work out. And just because someone has a criminal background doesn't mean that they're going to hurt you. You. And just because they don't have a criminal background, that doesn't mean that they're not going to hurt you. But I would say, especially for people like Ashley, and we've seen in so many other cases where these people do have criminal backgrounds already, find out what they have done in their past and use that to guide your decision going forward. I think that's one of the smartest things you can do for yourself and one of the best ways to just stay safe when you're dating. But with that being said, that is all of the information that I have for you on today's video. Obviously, this was a tragic case. My heart absolutely goes out to Danielle, her family, and everyone else who loved and cared for her. This never should have happened, and I'm devastated that Ashley will never have to face them or justice for what he did. But I do hope that cases like this one can serve as an example for other women out there of what can happen. Not to scare you, but to make you more aware and help you take the steps to protect yourself and your friends. So that is where I'm going to end today's video. You all heard my thoughts. Now I want to know what you all think. Why do you think Ashley was allowed out on bail? Do you think anything could have been done to prevent this? And do you have any tips for how we can keep ourselves and our loved ones safe that I didn't already mention? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.